Hello all, welcome back to our lecture series. Today we'll be finishing up with uh, chapter 7, uh, part 2. And again, we're still talking about enzymes, their mechanisms, and their control. So that is what we're looking at in chapter 7 or module 7. Okay, let's get it started immediately. What is the nature of the active site? Now, very, very important, to, we'll be looking at the nature of the active site. Now, before we do that, there are important questions that we need to answer. If we can answer those questions, we're going to understand everything about the active site. Number one, remember we said enzymes are mainly proteins. We only have just one exception, uh, which is uh, the ribosomal uh, enzymes. But we're not talking about that now. So now since they're proteins, and proteins are built from amino acids. And then, so the first question we need to answer is number one, What's the first question? Which amino acids are in the active site? We need to address this. What are the amino acids in the active site? Now, what is the spatial arrangement? What is the three-dimensional arrangement of these amino acids? If there are more than one of them, which will likely be, what is their orientation? How are they kept so that they can complement each other? And finally, what are the mechanisms? What are those chemical mechanisms involved when this amino acid will initiate catalysis. So, but it, we tend to answer these three questions in this chapter, and we're going to conclude with looking at a few of those enzyme helpers. Remember, we said these enzyme helpers are called coenzymes, and let's take it off from there. Amino acids in that. So, what are the amino acids in the active side? Now, in trying to study this, we're going to be using a typical enzyme, a typical digestive enzyme, the camotrypsin. The camotrypsin, I put it in yellow here because I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on it. The camotrypsin is called a serine protease. We know it's a digestive enzyme. We're going to use it as a model. Now, serine proteases are those that are those enzymes. We call them proteolytic enzymes because they actually catalyze the breakdown of um, of a peptide bonds. So, the class of proteolytic enzyme that has a serine. Remember, the serine is the amino acid serine. We classify this as a polar neutral amino acid because it has an OH group on its, uh, the OH group is what identifies it and puts it as a, that class of polar and neutral amino acid. So we call them serine proteases. Look at the word here, serine, because, like I said, they have serine, they, they, con they have the serine amino acid, and the serine amino acid is what plays an important role in their catalysis. Again, if you remember, I'm going to still show you the structure of this. Now, if I'm going to draw my serine, remember, if I put it this way, this is the alpha carbon. The alpha carbon has the carboxylic terminal end. It has the amino terminal end. Usually, both of them are ionized at neutral pH. Remember that? And then it has the hydrogen. Now, it has the, this that is not connected to the OH. So, this is the amino acid serine. It is this particular OH group that plays an important role, we're going to see. Because this OH group there, the O itself has two long pairs on it, and it is electron rich and therefore can get involved in what we call nucle nucleophilic attack. Now, serine does not do this alone. Serine, of course, is located in number 195, so we call it serine 195. It is involved directly in the catalysis because it initiated the nucleophilic attack. Now, histidine is located in number 57. Remember, histidine is what? It's a basic amino acid. It's critical for the activation of this chemotrypsin. What it does is that it is the histidine that initiated a general base attack on the serine, which now initiates the actual catalysis. Now, there is the aspartate as well. Again, aspartate is, a, is an acidic amino acid. Of course, remember, it has a net charge of negative. Now, aspartate is located in 102. It doesn't play a lot of function. Its main function is to provide stability for the transition state. That means the intermediate that is formed, and then in proper orientation of histidine, 57. So, of course, this chemotrypsin has been studied a lot. So, the result of the X-ray crystallography shows the definite spatial arrangement among this amino acid in the active site. Of course, the folding of chemotrypsin backbone is mostly an antiparal beta plated sheet, and the positions of this essential amino acid residue around the active site are in the in that pocket. That is what we're going to be seeing. 
So again, it's important to remember the structure of these amino acids. Serine 195 and 57, as I just said, they are required for the actual catalytic activity. And they must be close to each other in orientation for this to happen. Now, aspartate that is located in 102 is, is involved in catalysis at active site. What it actually does, it doesn't do much. Like I said, it provides stability for histidine 57. So it's not directly involved. But all these things, the common goal of all this arrangement is to bring overall success in the catalysis of that enzyme. So again, this is the histidine. Remember, histidine has the metazole ring. Histidine, this is the histidine here. And remember, this nitrogen histidine here has two lone pairs, and it is electron-rich, and it can initiate a nucleophilic attack. Remember that. Now, and we're going to see. If it does that, if you can accept the hydrogen, we call it a general base mechanism. We're going to see that much later. Then this is like I drew this already uh, earlier. Okay, no, I drew the serine earlier. Let me talk about that. This, uh, this is uh, the amino group. Remember that? And then this is, so this is the amino group. This is the alpha carbon. And this is what? This is the OH group that is involved in the catalyst. This OH group has two lone pairs on both sides. And again, this is what? This is the aspartate. Like I said, aspartate, it's, oh, this is serine, I need to write that. And this is aspartate. The aspartate is located in 102, and its main function is to help stabilize and orient or position histidine 57 for this catalysis to take place. Now, this three arrangement of amino acid is given a wonderful name. We call it the catalytic triad. Now, look at the catalytic triad. Now, this is the other part of the enzyme. Look at the histidine in number 57. This is it. This is serine in 197, and this is aspartate, aspartate in 102. So histidine and if you look at histidine and serine are very close to each other because this they are the ones that actually get involved in this catalysis. So these three amino acids bring about this catalysis, and this is what you see in the three-dimensional image in a ribbon-like representation. However, I tell my student I call this the three musketeers. So these three amino acids represent my three musketeer in making sure that this reaction takes place. So the special element of this three amino acid is called catalytic triad. Or you can just, don't say catalytic triad, you can say the three catalytic musketeers, as you can see in my animation at this side. So what are those catalytic mechanisms that are involved in, in, in reaction? Those enzymatic mechanisms. We're going to be talking about a few of them. And then we're going to pinpoint it with our example on how chemotrypsin. Remember, I said chemotrypsin is our model in trying to understand how this takes place. So let's look at those few mechanisms shortly before we get into how does a chemotrypsin uh, get involved in catalysis. Number one, the first catalytic mechanism is the covalent catalysis. This simply means the formation of a transient covalent bond. You know, some catalysis take place that, um, leads to the formation of a temporary covalent bond between the enzyme and the substrate. Now remember, this temporary covalent bond is just but what? The transition state, which we automatically break down to give you the product and then releasing the free enzyme. Now, the most important sub-mechanism involved in, catalyst, in, in covalent catalysis is the nucleophilic attack or substitution. We call it the nucleophilic attack or substitution. You can call it the nucleophilic attack if chemists want to use that word, attack. Now what happens here? In nucleophilic attack, an electron-rich atom, an electron-rich atom is an atom that has a lot of electrons. It has a lot of electrons. Now these electrons can be used to attack other another one that doesn't have much electron. So a nucleophile will attack an electrophile. And in that process, it forms a transient covalent bond. And that is what you can see. Now, so this is a nucleophile. He has the structural electron. This guy is electron deficient. That is why he's positively charged. You see, this is negatively charged. Any negatively charged atom is highly electron rich. He's going to attack this one. And in that process, it forms a covalent bond between the two. That is exactly what we call a nucleophilic substitutional attack. So oxygen we find in the serine is a nucleophile. Remember again, let me just put the OH group. If this is the OH group, remember this is the OH group, and this is the OH group. Now, okay, let me try to make it completely full. Okay, 
this is the orange group now this oxygen is a nucleophile because it has one two three four F four electrons around it or you can say two pairs of electrons so it is a nucleophile that actually goes on to attack the what what does it attack the carbon and carbon in the peptide bond to form a temporary uh, a temporary or an intermediate that intermediate is the transition state and we usually call an intermediate that has four things attached to the central carbon we usually call it what a tetrahedral intermediate so look at what happens here now this is a good example this is let's believe that this is let's assume this is our peptide bond now so a peptide bond will have the CO connected to a nitrogen now this is enzyme remember this enzyme this atom is part of this enzyme remember this serine is part of this enzyme but it has two electrons that are free these electrons will then attack this carbon and as it does this attack the, the other electrons will go on to what attack this oxygen here and this leads to the formation of what this complex this is a temporary enzyme substrate complex and this is what we call tetrahedral intermediate and what we say tetrahedral is because it has a tetrahedral shape tetrahedral intermediate because a tetrahedral geometry remember in your vespa model a tetrahedral geometry tells you that there are four atoms attached to the center so this is there is y there is o there is r and there is x attached to this carbon so this is a tetrahedral intermediate and remember this tetrahedral intermediate is just about what the transition state and what happens next this tetrahedral intermediate is going to rearrange itself and remove this bond and at the end of the day it has broken it and another reaction will take place whereby enzyme is released but this is a very good example of covalent catalysis the second one the cat we're not talking about another one the general acid base in general acid base mechanisms what happens is that other molecules or atoms beside water molecule act as an acid or a base remember an acid will donate a proton a base will accept a proton now in specific acid base catalysis it is just water you know water if you break water then water has the OH and the H plus are involved water is, to what, is what is used in accelerating that reaction and we're going to see this this, this is just a very good example now in the first one look at this water is involved now water here is involved in making this reaction take place now if you go down here look at what is happening here since it's just water that is involved here only this is a specific base catalysis in specific base remember the OH group i told you is always the base that has the, that produces the OH. the OH is a nucleophilic is a nucleophile and it will attack this carbon and carbon to do us to form an intermediate again this intermediate we have a carbon that has 14 attached again this is what the tetrahedral intermediate then it will now rearrange itself to release this this first part and then form this the other part and at the end of the the enzyme will be released now in general base catalysis look at what is happening here you don't have water molecule what you have is so this looks like this is not histidine but histidine is built from this this is an imidazole now in this imidazole remember what i told you about nitrogen nitrogen will always have three bonds and one long pair this long pair that which is two electrons is electron rich what is it going to do this will act as a general base and a base is what accepts a, a proton a hydrogen goes there to abstract this proton from water molecule here and then what does it do it now destabilizes this water molecule here and makes this a stronger nucleophile which now attacks this bond and leads to the formation of this intermediate which will rearrange again to break down to these ones so this is this is how this takes place so this is what we call general acid base catalysis so general acid base is when the other molecule apart from water is involved as an acid or a base and when it is just water we say it is specific acid base catalysis and the third mechanism of action we're going to be looking at here is the metal ion catalysis now at times metal ions come in to form to stabilize the transition state that's exactly what happens here now what does it do many examples we know use metal ions like manganese like magnesium like zinc ions now if the metal is important that I, I i i talk about this vocabulary if a metal is tightly bound to this enzyme to maintain its native state just like we saw in both myoglobin and hem 
We say that enzyme or that protein is called metallo enzyme or metalloprotein. In this case, we're talking about enzyme, so we call it metallo enzyme. Now, if the enzyme binds quickly or only during catalysis, that is when the metal is prominent. We score that type of enzyme as metal activated enzyme. So metal can make it easier for a nucleophile to form. Now, one of the things it does is that it makes it easy to form a nucleophile. And remember, whenever I form a nucleophile, it's going to attack and that's going to lead to the formation of a covalent bond. Now, metal also facilitates the release of a proton from, that is bound to water. What this means is that metal will also lead to what? The, a metal presence, a metal ion presence in an enzyme or in an environment of reaction will lead to the formation of either a general base or a specific base or a specific acid or general acid and that will also lead to the initiation of a nucleophilic attack in the hydride ion and then the reaction will take place and metal can also promote what the production of an electrophile which is electron division which in turn does what stabilizes the transition state and we can see that in this example thermolysine is an endoprotease that has zinc ion as its catalytic metal the same thing happens in uh, carboxypeptides which also uses zinc metal zinc ion now in the active side so zinc ion what does it do is that it stabilizes the buildup of negative charge on the peptide carbonyl carbon as as a glutamate do the protonate water promoting hydroxide ion attack on the carbonyl carbon let's see what happens here now this is glutamate so of course this is a rich this is an, a, a nucleophile attack this takes this away and then what happens then the moment this thing happens look at this now initiate an attack on this one now you see this zinc is providing stability here as well and then we're gonna have this look at all now so you're gonna have an intermediate here now look at this intermediate again remember this is every of this intermediate will always be a tetrahedral intermediate now this is providing a stabilization for this transition state this is the transition state or you can say the what the in between the temporary intermediate in between the enzyme substrate and then the enzyme product that's exactly what you have here so having known these three mechanisms let's now begin to happen now looking at the three musketeers remember the three musketeers here will use this three mechanism of action except metal ion catalysis so what it means is that what is going to be happening here is the general base the general uh, yeah the general acid base and then the covalent catalysis by nucleophilic attack so let me see the function of my what the functions of my what of my three musketeer remember my three musketeer are serine 195 histidine 57 and the last guy is going to be what it's going to be aspartate 102 so these are my three musketeers so i'm going to see how they're going to initiate this now for the purpose of confidence and simplicity at the level of this class the aspartate is not shown aspartate is not shown i told you its function is only to stabilize what the histidine is is not shown here so do not be confused if you can do this in exam for me you have done well so i don't need you to show me aspartate because the fun the function is playing is very simplistic so what is happening now we're going to divide this can go into more than this stage you can go into eight stages but for simplicity with the text i'm using it is organized into two main stages of three parts each i'm going to explain how this works the first thing that happens here is that again we look at these are serine 195 and histidine they are very close to each other in the first part remember again the serine now sorry the histidine has two electrons here if i'm going to show you these two electrons here a dot here and a dot here which makes it a strong nucleophile this nucleophile now remember if it is going to go and take a hydrogen it is acting as what a base so the first mechanism of action here is general what base catalysis whereby the imidazole ring of the histidine is going to take this hydrogen ion this hydrogen from the OH of serine then activating serine to even be a stronger what nucleophile what does nucle what does it do now serine now goes on to attack the carbonyl carbon of the peptide and this carbonyl carbon of the peptide will now be destabilized and that will now attack this oxygen here and that will lead to the first formation of the tetrahedral intermediate 
in the tetrahedron intermediate, what are we saying? You find what do you see? You find out that this is the enzyme now, right? This is the enzyme forms what the enzyme now forms what you see forms a covalent bond. This is the covalent bond here. That is the covalent bond. Covalent bond formed. Now, so if you count the number of things attached to this carbon, it is now one, two, one, two, three, four. So that is what makes it equivalent intermediate. Now, what, look at what is happening now. The new, now, because this histidine took this hydrogen from here, it now forms a tricent covalent bond between itself. And this tricent covalent bond will also form a temporary hydrogen bonding which stabilizes this transition state, both from the oxygen side and from what the amino group of what of the of the peptide of the peptide or the protein that is being hydrolyzed now what happens again now just know that you for this stratoidian intermediate has made this oxygen here to be a strong nucleophile it is negatively charged and what it means here it has three long pairs around it now it's going to go back and attack this bone again and this one will do what will now go to attack this one again to take away this hydrogen as well that's what it's going to do. So it's going to go here, take away this hydrogen. As that happens again, look at what happens. As it's taking away this hydrogen, it breaks this bond and releases the amino terminal. So this is the amino terminal end of that peptide being broken down. And this amino terminal end will now form. And what do you see happening here? You now see that this goes back to still enzyme being attached. This is now what we call the acyl enzyme intermediate. So the enzyme is attached to the SC group. The C group is this CO connected to another met, another uh, AK group. It could be methyl, it could be anything. All right. So this is what we call a cell enzyme. And if you look at the structure of this SC enzyme intermediate, it is trigonal planar because you have three things attached around the carbon atom. So you found out that now it, the intermediate it has changed. The intermediate here at the first intermediate was the intermediate here was tetrahedral in structure, and this now is what is trigonal planar we say it is trigonal planar in structure trigonal planar in structure now that is the first stage of this reaction so the first stage leads to the what the release of the amino terminal portion of the peptide or the polypeptide being broken or hydrolyzed then what about the second stage the second stage the the main aim of the second stage is now you have the enzyme now connected to the through the carboxylic portion. You want to remove it. So that is exactly the end. Just let the lesson be liberated. So what happens again? The opposite of what happens again will begin to happen. Look at what happens again. Again, remember here, histidine again will now produce another nucleophilic attack. In this case now, water is going to come in. Remember again, when water comes in, what do you expect? Specific base catalysis. So water is coming in now. Now this, this is water. This, of course, this nitrogen again, has two lumpers. It attacks this hydrogen, takes away this hydrogen, and makes this oxygen here to be a strong nucleophile. This oxygen now attacks this carbon and carbon and forms another tetrahedral intermediate. This is another tetrahedral intermediate that has a carbon with four stuff attached around it, including the OH from water here. Now, again, remember that a, a, a covalent bond is formed from here, and another covalent bond is formed, and then the reverse will begin to happen. Just know again that this this oxygen here again is the nucleophile. What is it going to do? It's going to initiate another attack to take away this hydrogen, and this will lead, of course, it's going to start from here. This 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 O minus is a strong nucleophile. Comes to attack this bond. This one will now attack this one to take away this hydrogen, and what happens at the end of the day is now going to lead to the breakage of this point. So it's going to take away this hydrogen, which is part of it originally, and now it's going to form back the serine which has the OH and now here the double bond will reform between this carbon and this oxygen to form the carbon and carbon and of course what happens here again the OH here now this is now the O minus as this started again remember this O minus represents the what represents the what the carbo carboxylic terminal remember this is the amino terminal end was released first this is now the carboxylic terminal end of that peptide that has been broken and this is what we call the mechanism of action of the catalytic triad or what i tell my student which i call the most the three musketeer so this is exactly what i want you to do for me in exam i may draw these things and ask you specific question on them 
or I can tell you to do one or two first stage or the second stage depending on how I want you to do it. All right, well, let's now go to the next stuff. Let's now talk about something special about enzymes, specificity of enzymes. You see, there are three specificity. Enzymes are highly specific. This is one of the things we talked about. One of the types of enzymes that they are specific. They recognize a particular substrate that they need to act on. So, and it, this specific can be in different levels. Absolute specificity, specificity is a reaction whereby a particular enzyme only catalyzes a particular substrate. It is specific for that substrate. So if you give it something that is even closely related, it's not going to work on it. A good example is glucokinase. Glucokinase catalyzes the phosphorylation of glucose to glucose phosphate. This is the first reaction of glycolysis, catalyzing glucose to glucose phosphate. Now, glucose phosphate only catalyzes, only acts on glucose. It can, remember, we have hexosis. The hexosis can be both the fructose, fructose is a hexose, galactose is a hexose, and what again, glucose itself is a hexose. Now, the glucokinase only acts on the glucose, according to the name. It will only act on phosphorylation of the glucose and no other one. However, now, we now go to the second one, the relative specific. In relative specificity, an enzyme can catalyze a group of structurally related substrate or compound. And a very good example is also, I'm going to use another one in glycolysis, hexokinase. Hexokinase is not specific. Hexokinase enzyme can catalyze any hexose, whether it is fructose, whether it is glucose, whether it is galactose. It is not specific, just like this one, because both of them are all structurally related. And that is why it can catalyze every of them. And then an enzyme can also be stereospecific. Remember, in stereospecificity, we talk about chiral carbon. So what it means is that this enzyme has the ability to decipher an element, so a compound that is that has a chiral carbon. And a very good example is the hydration of cisarcane and... Okay, like I said, so a good example here we'll be looking at is the hydration of C's alkene. Okay, I'm going to leave that. Okay, so C's alkene. Now, the enzyme can catalyze the C's conformation, but not the trans isom, because it has the ability to be that, to be that specific in nature. And that's what we're going to see on the next. Day. So enzymes has the ability to be stereospecific, so they can discover a chiral carbon. So they are that specific. They can discover a cara carbon. So the next thing, the nature of the transition state. So we've been talking about this intermediate, this transition state a lot. So you see, enzyme proof, what happens at the transition state? Remember, the transition state, the true nature of the transition state is that it's an intermediate in structure between the structure of the substrate and structure of the product. That's exactly what it is. So the enzyme provides an alternative pathway that that has a lower activation energy. Remember, the main goal of an enzyme is to reduce the activation energy of that reaction so that products, products are going to be formed earlier. So the transition state will have different shape from either the substrate or the product. So, and in medicine today, a group of compounds we call the transition state analog are usually synthesized to use in medicine as drugs. What do they do? They mimic or they, 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 they mimic the, the, the structure of the true compound. So these are synthesized compounds that mimic the true form of the transition state of an enzyme. And now what do they do? Remember, they are bad. What they do is that not, the enzyme now thinks that this transition state analog is the substrate. It binds on it and it binds permanently to the enzyme without forming any product. And most of them are going to do what? So most of them are going to inactivate this enzyme and in that process bringing about their pharmacological effect as drugs. So a very good example is what we have here. This is the L-proline, of course, you know, remember, proline is an enzyme. Now, this is the L-proline, this is the D-proline. Now, an enzyme, an, a kind of isomerase enzyme, or we call it a resmerase because this is resmerization, will bring about the catalyzation of this L-proline to D-proline. That's what it's just doing. What it's doing here is to change that configuration from L to D-isom. And look at what happens here. If you're going to change this one, you have the COA, you have this here. It changed both of them, have the hydrogen here. So what it means is that it's actually changing the conformation from L to D. This is what the enzyme is doing. Now, in between these two, there is a transition state, uh, intermediate, or a transition state or intermediate brief form. This intermediate has the planar configuration. Remember, this is three-dimensional. This is three-dimensional. 
A planner doesn't have three dimensions. A planner just looks like a plane, remember? So the intermediate is the planner between these two that is neither L or neither D. Now this is what then, so this is the transition state or the intermediate of these, of the, of this reaction. Now we can have an inhibitor that will prevent this racemization. This can be done by this. And look at this. This is what pyro 2 carboxylate. This is a pyro. If you look at it, it is structurally related to this. The only difference is that it doesn't have this what? The two double bond on the, on both of this side. And the enzyme will come bind to this, thinking that this is a substrate. And then it binds and will not bring about any catalysis because an inhibitor binds there to prevent catalysis or as much as possible slow it down. So this is actually how most of these transition state analog carry out their inhibition or their, or doing their job in slowing the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. So coenzymes, remember earlier when we talked about enzyme in the, in the first part of this class, I talked about the enzyme helpers. Coenzymes are the non-protein substances that take part in enzyme reaction. Now, of course, like enzymes, they are regenerated at the end of the reaction. They are not lost. They are not broken. They are not structurally denatured or anything happens to them. They are regenerated just like the enzymes. They can also, like I said, they can be metal ions or they can be what? Derivative of vitamins. And most of the vitamins, particularly those of them of the vitamins, are usually involved in oxidation reduction reaction or the transfer groups. Two things they do is that they involve an oxidation reaction, oxidation reduction reaction, or transfer of what? Groups, like methyl groups or amino groups and all the rest of them. Now we're going to be seeing a few of them and how they act, and then the rest of them we're going to be talking about by the time we get into intermediary metabolism. So coenzyme and cofactors, a list to my left here are the metal ions and some enzymes that catalyze, like the ion is needed by the stratochrome oxidase or the catalyst, or even the peroxidase, copper ion is needed by the cytochrome oxidase, zinc is needed by the DNA polymerase, are all listed. You can, you can look at the notes and also pause the video or pause the video and look at this thing yourselves. And then because you, you are, you are expected to know some of these examples. And then the coenzymes at this point, look at the timing pyrophosphate, it transfers the aldehyde. A good example is in pyruvate dehydrogenase. Flavina, the ring, the nucleotide, which we call FAD, I'm gonna, we're gonna see how this works. Transfers hydrogen atom. Example in sustenate dehydrogenase. We're going to talk about these two. The nicotinamide, the nicotinamide, or NAD. What does it do? It transfers the hydride ion, and then we see that in alcohol dehydrogenase. So, and a few other ones you're going to look at here and how they carry out, the, how they help the enzyme do its function. Now, let's talk about the first one, the NAD, the nicotinamide, the nicotinamide. Remember, the oxidized form is the NAD+, plus. the reduced form is NADH. Remember, oxidation means Oxidation mainly, as we're going to see in this, in, in, in intermediary metabolism, oxidation will be what? We're going to see oxidation as removal of hydrogen, and we're going to see reduction as addition of hydrogen. So if you look at this one, this one has no hydrogen, so it is the what? Oxidized form. This one has the hydrogen, it is the reduced form. So the coen it is a coenzyme in many oxidation reduction reactions. Now the structure consists of, consists of three things basically. It has the adenine, which is a purine uh, base, then we have the ribose sugar. The ribose sugar is just have five carbons. And then we have the nicotine, which is the main place where the, the, the reaction takes place. The nicotine is, the nicotine itself is where the reaction itself takes place. And then both of these ribose sugars, both the one on nicotine and the one on the adenine are connected by two phosphate groups. This is also another good example of what I see here. Now, why I decided to put this is also to tell you, this is exactly what I have here, but the difference is that I like this annotation here. Now, remember, there's another type of NAD. We call it the NADP, nicotine adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Now, in this one, at this point, a phosphate group is attached through, of course, a phosphate diester bond to become NAD. And we're going to see this by the time we get into metabolism Again, now how does this work? Now, the man that discovered this and won a Nobel Prize is Arthur Hayden, is a British that discovered, co discovered nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. I decided to put these pictures here. So, Arthur Hayden of the blessed memory. So, let's now move to this point. Now, now, what happens at the NAD or NADH? 
The main reaction takes place at the nicotinamide ring. Remember, the nicotinamide ring is where the reaction takes place. So what is happening there? Now, what is happening there is that now this nicotinamide ring can exist in two can exist in resonance. Remember what resonance means? Where a particular structure will have two equivalent Lewis structures. A compound. So look at the structure. So now there is the movement, and you know it is because of the movement of electrons. That is why resonance takes place in the first place. So now these electrons here. Remember, if a single bond means electron can move away to this one, forming a double bond here, and this one can move to this one. What happens here? And then this can move to this one. So when this happens, it forms this. Again, remember, in this case, nitrogen has four bonds. It's supposed to have three. It has four bonds. It has excess. So you need to have a charge of plus one. Here, it has normal three bonds and two lone pairs. Now, what happens is that it does transfer, it does transfer hydrogen atoms as hydride ions. So what happens is that two hydrogen atoms, one as hydride ion and one as H plus, are involved coming from the substrate. They are not going to be transferred. Now remember, a hydride ion means hydrogen has gained one more electron. In this case, forming a hydride ion that has a negative charge. Because of the negative charge, it's a strong nucleophile. What does it do? It attacks this carbon that is an electrophile, doesn't have, and forms a covalent bond between it. And then this is what happens. So this is at this point is what we call this is the NAD plus without having any this is the NAD plus this plus is what makes it the plus here and then when it forms this covalent bond between this hydrogen and this carbon it forms the NADH so this happens at the nicotinamide ring and remember this the other hydrogen ion is left in solution does not participate in the reaction so this is the mechanism of action of the NAD plus or NADH now let's look at the, the next one now now the this has three groups, three types of it. The, 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 the flavin or the, yeah, the riboflavin and its derivatives. So you can form the riboflavin, the flavin mononucleotide or the flavin adenine dinucleotide. Now let's see what happens. See, this contains an isoalazine. This isoalazine is connected to the rubito. The rubito is one, two, three, four, five. A type of sugar that has five carbon two, right? Now, but in this case, it is not a ribose this is a rubito now the rubito is now connected to a phosphate now if you stop at this point this is what you call your riboflavin this is a riboflavin as in vitamin riboflavin now the vitamin riboflavin like i said now if you connect through a phosphate group to adenine again only one phosphate group here is going to be is going to be flavin mononucleotide because it only has one phosphate now, if you connect it with the two phosphate groups to the adenine, to adenosine again, it's going to form flavin adenine dinucleotide. So the three of them are what I represented in this row. So it can be riboflavin, can be flavin mononucleotide, or flavin adenine dinucleotide. Three of these guys can easily work. However, the reaction site is, the reaction site is on this isoalazine ring, as I'm going to show you in the next slide. So the flavin adenine dinucleotide is the commonest one that we, we encounter in, uh, in, in metabolism particularly. So we're going to see that particularly in, uh, in the citric acid cycle. So now, the, the reduced form is FADH2 because it has the hydrogen. The oxidized form is what? Is FAD. So what happens here? Now, it accepts protons and electrons. That's what it does. Anytime two protons are transferred, you have to accept two electrons. So what happens here is that now if you want to put two double bonds here, you're right. You can put this means two a double bond here, and this means a double bond. This means a double bond. So what happens is that two two of this hydrogen, one goes to this point, and one of them goes to this point to form one hydrogen here and one hydrogen here. So this is the center of its reactivity. So it accepts unlike the FAD, they only accept one hydride ion. This accepts two hydrogen atoms to form at this point of the reaction side. So this is the mechanism of action of, of, of FAD or FADH2 as the case may be. Okay. And then we go to the next slide. We talk about the vitamin B6. The vitamin B6 is of course the pyridoxal. It's called the pyridoxine, the pyridoxal, the pyridoxamine or the pyridoxine, whichever one you call it. It is pyridoxal when it has the aldehyde here. Al means aldehyde. Pyridoxamine when it has an amino group here. Now, it is called the pyridoxine when it is an alcohol here. It is the pyridoxal phosphate when you connect a phosphate group here. It is the pyridoxamine phosphate when it has an amino group here. 
and also has a phosphate group here. So these are those type of the types of this thing you're going to see. So the pyridoxal and the pyridoxamine phosphate are involved in group transfer reaction. Group transfer basically what they do is to transfer the amino group. They transfer the amino group in intermediary metabolism, and we see this in what we call in transamination in the metabolism of amino acid. So in metabolism of amino acid, what happens here? Glutamine is acting as a source of amino group, which it wants to put on top of this place. So the function of this enzyme here, enzyme which we call the transaminase, is to take this amino group and come and connect it here. However, it does not do that. So when it does that, this one is now, glutamate will now form a keto acid. This keto acid here is alpha ketoglutarate. And then when you add, this is pyruvate. When you add amino group to a pyruvate, it forms alanine, which is an amino acid. Now listen, this reaction takes place in in series of intermediate cells involving the interaction between the enzyme transaminase and the pyridoxal phosphate. What happens here? Now, this is the pyridoxal phosphate here plus the enzyme. Now, the in association. What happens here is that the glutamine, which has the amino group, now, first of all, transfers this amino group to this enzyme. That's exactly what happens here. And now, it transfers it, and this enzyme is in association to the pyridoxal phosphate. Remember again, this is the protein. Protein means the enzyme. Now, this is the pyridoxal phosphate. So, the enzyme pyridoxal phosphate complex. Remember, we said this coenzyme is what helps this enzyme to act. So, it's in association with each coenzyme. Now, what happens is that the coenzyme, the amino group is first delivered to this pyridoxal phosphate, forming this transition state. This is the intermediate. The intermediate, or what we call the transition state the transition state intermediate. Now, it is this guy now that will take this and deliver it to what? To the pyruvate. And if he gives it the pyruvate, the pyruvate is not going to form the alanine and then releases the enzyme and its coenzyme again to be free. So this is the mechanism of action of pyridoxal phosphate of the BC's vitamins. So, and with that being said, we come to the end of this lecture. Thank you once again for listening and do have a wonderful day ahead and bye at this point.